Welcome, dear listeners, to Horror Den of Misfits. Story time. I'm a park ranger, and I've been at my present job for about four years now. I would like to share with you all my sightings of what many claim are the supposed, unidentified creatures. I believe they exist, and I've seen it myself. The sighting I had of this creature was in September of 2004. I was working the night shift at the time, patrolling one of the more popular trails. I heard the sound of heavy footsteps on the trail, so I turned to look, shining a light over in that direction where I heard the noise. I saw a very tall bipedal humanoid stepping out on the path behind me. I could distinctly see its silhouette as it was illuminated. It turned in response to my light shining on it and I was incredibly frightened by the sight before me. This thing looked every bit as vicious as you can imagine. If there was ever a real-life werewolf, this was it. In complete paralysis of fear, it kind of just slowly lumbered away into the darkness. I've never told anybody about this incident out of fear of ridicule and disbelief, but I saw it with my own eyes and can attest to the authenticity of this being. I had a second encounter, unfortunately, It was the summer of 2009, almost five years later. I was on patrol yet again, this time on a sunny afternoon, midday. I was just doing my usual, but I could feel something drawing closer behind me. I turned around to look, and nothing was there. Figuring I was just getting paranoid, I ignored it and continued on the best I could. However, the feeling began to grow and intensify. I couldn't shake the feeling that I was being followed. I got on a call with one of my teammates about the job I was working on, and I began to hear heavy breathing. I stopped the radio call and shortly looked around me to see if I could see where the breathing was coming from or who or what was making it. It was this deep, heavy breathing getting closer and closer. I could hear it coming up behind me on the other side of the trail. I felt immediate danger and made a hasty decision that I had to get out of here and now. All I knew is that a large predator was stalking me and was going to keep pursuing me. I know a lot of people could easily write this off, but I'm telling you, there was something out there with me in the woods that day. It was not a bear, it was not a normal animal. This was something with intelligence that was coming after me. Had I not acted, I was going to be its next meal. My first week as a fire lookout stationed at Fire Tower 14 had started off okay. All my life I'd wanted to be a park ranger, and now I was within one day of accomplishing that goal. After this final day of training, I was to be left on my own. But something catastrophic had happened, derailing all of those plans. After seeing two separate fires burning in the distance, my supervisor and I had set off in our jeep to check out what we assumed were campfires. He had left me alone to investigate one group of offenders, while he approached the other campsite. Everything was going according to plan until I stumbled across a stone archway in the forest that looked very out of place. On the other side the sky was purple, whereas on our side it was blue. But I mistook that for the setting sun, or some other phenomena, and pressed onward, going through it. I wish I'd trusted my instincts, and stayed on the other side of the arch because now I'm trapped in another world, with no way home. The archway disappeared, leaving me stranded here. And I quickly realized I wasn't alone. There were creatures in the forest that looked like people but were not. They had an extra set of arms, for one thing, and they called back to you if you spoke, but they were not human. Despite all odds, I'd been rescued by another park ranger right before getting mauled by the bizarre creatures. This man, who told me his name was David, said he had been trapped in this place for a month. He had a cave which he managed to camouflage with tree branches, allowing us to hide from the creatures after escaping from them. David knew a lot about this place, and he said the creatures avoided a certain part of the forest, so that was where he took me. He had set up traps, which only he knew the placement of, and his hideout was there, stocked with provisions. A lot of the plant life here is the same as in our world, he told me when we arrived back at his camp. I found a patch of shiitake mushrooms and I've been surviving on those more or less. I had a few things in my bag, an energy bar, some trail mix, 
you know, the usual stuff, but I ran out of that pretty quickly. He showed me his little pile of foraged food and I marveled at how well prepared he was. There were different species of mushrooms, some wild root vegetables, and some roughage he'd set aside to make a salad with. This is incredible, I said. And I thought I was a good survivalist. You're still young, he told me. I've been doing this sort of thing for a long time. I was in the British Special Air Services when I was younger. They're highly trained soldiers, sort of like your special forces. Since I got across the pond I've worked here and there, but most recently I've been the fire lookout at Tower 14 for almost 10 years. I let out a soft gasp. That's where I'm stationed. You worked at Tower 14? He chuckled. Worked. Past tense. Damn. Those bastards replaced me already, eh? Well, I guess they must have given up looking for me too, then. I thought back to that odd look Ross had given me when letting me out of the jeep. He looked like he was going to say something, but maybe, don't get killed or disappear like the last guy, would have been too on the nose. Maybe he'd been thinking about how this was a bad idea, I realized. Maybe he was thinking we should go together. But instead he'd let me go alone. I felt a twinge of anger, thinking about how none of this would have happened if Ross had been shadowing me like he was supposed to be. They're still looking for you, I said, not really knowing if that was true. I'm sure they are. They wouldn't just forget about you. Ross didn't get around to telling me yet, that's all. I'm still in training. I didn't add that this was my last day of training. Or that news of David's disappearance seemed to have been purposefully omitted from my orientation. David eyed me suspiciously, but didn't say another word about it. I was going out to look for more mushrooms when I spotted you. It's too dangerous to go out again tonight, but tomorrow we'll check for the archway again and I'll show you the shiitake grove. I go back to that same spot every day and look for that arch. I can't believe I missed it. He was peeling a mushroom with his knife as he spoke, but with that last sentence he hurled the blade across the room where it clanged against the rock wall, making a loud noise. Quiet. I whisper yelled at him. I know you're upset but we're gonna get out of here. His face was emotionless as he looked back at me, tears welling up in his eyes. That's what I've been telling myself for the last 36 days, he said. I hope to God you're right. As I tried to fall asleep that night, I couldn't. The idea of a man like David being brought to tears by this place was almost too much to bear. The man was a killing machine. British Special Forces. He had saved my life and pulled me out of a situation where I'd thought I would be dead for sure. At least we had more ammunition, now. And two guns. Still, that didn't reassure me very much. Those creatures, whatever they were, did not like to die. I managed a few hours of off and on sleep before the sun came up, still appearing that same horrible shade of purple as it had the day prior. It was starting to hurt my head. It felt wrong just being in this place, like we didn't belong here. Like the air was too thick and too heavy, not meant for me to breathe. Without even realizing it, I had begun to hyperventilate. I tried to stop myself, to calm myself down, but was unable to. David came over and looked in my eyes, and after a while I started to hear the words he was saying. The cave was still beginning to turn darker and darker all around me, and I could feel myself losing consciousness, but I managed to listen to him. Breathe deep, he said. Slow it down. You're okay. I've lived here this long. The air is breathable. You're okay. Big, deep breaths, lad. Good. Okay, that's better. Keep breathing, in and out. After a while I started to calm down, and looked at him gratefully. Thanks, I said. I needed that. Stay there and get your wits about you. I've got breakfast ready, he said and I realized he had a portion of mushrooms and wild lettuce set aside for me. He brought it over on a flat rock and handed the food to me. What's the plan? I asked, eyeing the food suspiciously. Despite the fact that he said it was okay, I was still concerned. Eat, he told me. You need your energy. We're gonna walk over to the shiitake patch. On the way, we'll check for the arch. On the way back, we'll check again. That's all we can really do. It's not safe lingering out there for too long. 
Those things, they can smell us. I managed to eat a bit of the salad and mushrooms, despite the fact that they made me uneasy. Consuming anything, even the air, in this world, felt wrong. Like I was breathing in toxic fumes not meant for human consumption. Still, a little bit of food couldn't hurt me. At least, that's what I told myself. After eating, we set out for the archway. The hike was a long one, and David brought plenty of water and provisions, filling up our canteens from a spring along the way. Once again, I felt glad for his guidance. If not for him, I'd probably be dead ten times by now. After a long while we reached the clearing where the arch had been. Once again, it wasn't there. The spot where it had been was empty, but we wandered over to it anyway. How can it just disappear? Be here one day and gone the next? I asked. David shook his head. How can any of this be possible? I wouldn't have believed it if someone told me. Would you? I thought about that for a few seconds. No, probably not. I'd think they were crazy. Or high. Or maybe both. And yet, here we are. Defying all rational common sense. There wasn't much more to say, so we continued walking. I tried desperately to ignore the feeling that I heard the sounds of rustling leaves behind us. As if someone were following quietly, and at a distance. Every time I looked back, there was no one there. Eventually we reached the shiitake patch. David told me to start picking the mushrooms quickly, before the creatures found us. He said they were smart, and would send out scouts. So once they knew where we were, more would be gathered together and they would come back to hunt us like pack animals. The worst part was, they knew this was a favorite spot of his, so they would be ready for him. After a few short minutes of gathering mushrooms, David told me to wrap up. Let's go, he said. There's no more time. Despite my fear I couldn't believe what he was saying. We had just started. It had been such a long hike, and this small amount of mushrooms would barely sustain us for a day. Come on, David, I said. A few more minutes. I said, let's go, he hissed at me, his face morphing into one of rage. I almost didn't recognize him. His color changed, going red, almost purple. And there was something else strange too. His chest seemed to spasm when he was angry. The fabric puffed in and out in a very odd way, like he was breathing much too fast. He caught me looking at him and calmed down slightly, then came over to me and grabbed my arm dragging me away from the mushroom patch. I can see one. It's a little ways away, at 6 o'clock. That means there's more. We need to start walking fast. Don't run yet. Don't look. Don't let them know we saw them. All of this he said while dragging me away from the mushroom patch, and I fought the urge to glance over my shoulder. But I did hear the distinct sound of movement now, coming closer, gaining on us steadily. Do you hear that? I asked, my heart pounding faster, my throat dry, my knees shaking. Quiet, he whispered angrily. I was silent for a few short seconds, and the noises came closer, and closer. Run! He screamed, and I began to bolt as fast as I could through the trees. A second later, I heard them all around us. They had surrounded us. They'd been waiting. Your gun! David screamed from behind me and I tried to get it ready while still running. Then I saw what he was worried about, one of the creatures was straight ahead, waiting for us partially hidden behind a tree. It revealed itself just barely, poking its head out to look and see how far off we were, then it disappeared again. You see it? He shouted. Yeah. When we get to that tree, you go left, I go right. Don't get too close. I understood immediately what he was doing. He was sacrificing himself for me. By going to the right, he was running right through the eye line of the creature. He would be running past it within inches of its grasp. All to distract it so it wouldn't get me. Part of me wanted to argue, but there was no time. We were already at the tree. I ran to the left and David went right. The creature lunged at him, just as I'd feared, and managed to rake him with its long talon-like fingernails. His back was bloodied as he ran getting ahead of me as he put on speed. There's more up ahead, he yelled. And I saw them a second later. There were at least two, maybe more. Hiding in the trees and waiting for us a little ways ahead. 
I had a feeling they would not be fooled as easily as the last one. Luckily we had a speed advantage on the creatures. At least the ones we'd come across so far. I hated to think what a faster version of these things would look like. Our ability to outrun them was the only thing keeping us alive. I could hear them chasing after us, their heavy footsteps loud as they crushed the leaves underfoot. Let's split up, David said. You go left, I'll go right. Then we meet back in the middle, say a hundred paces from here. Got it? Sure, I agreed, not sure what other options we had. I was deferring to him, since he seemed to know what he was doing. Now, he yelled, and branched off from our trajectory, heading to the right. At the same time, I went left. The creatures took a moment to respond, but once they saw what we were doing, they left their hiding spot where they were waiting to ambush us. The creature closest to me came at me from my right and I screamed as it came within a few feet of me, its horrifying arms reaching out to grab me. I felt the breeze from its hand rushing past, but managed to duck out of the way just in time, stumbling over a fallen log and face planting right afterwards. The thing crawled after me and I felt it grab my ankle, pulling me towards it as I screamed. Kicking as hard as I could with my other leg, I brought my foot up into the creature's jaw, where it connected with a sickening crunch. It howled a cry of hurt anger as its grip loosened on my ankle for a split second. I attempted to wrench myself free but it held on tightly. The thing was strong. I was about to kick it again when it grabbed my other leg and began to crawl in towards my face. Its oversized eyes widened with anticipation, drool pouring out over its lower lip. The thing was about to eat me. As it unhinged its jaw like a python about to consume a deer, I remembered the rifle slung across my back. The thing darted its head forward toward my neck, as if to start its meal with my jugular. The rifle was caught underneath my body weight. I was trying to rock side to side to pull it free while simultaneously shoving the thing away from me with my knees, kicking and bucking and doing anything I could to weasel my way out from its grasp. Just as its teeth were about to snap shut around my windpipe, I managed to free the rifle. Using all of my strength, I pulled my knees back and kicked the creature in its chest, sending it reeling backwards for half an instant. Just enough time for me to get a shot off. Boom! The blast echoed through the forest, exploding outwards from the barrel of my rifle. One moment the creature was there in front of me, the next its head was gone, replaced by a bloody crater jettisoning blood from the ruined remains of the creature's visage. I scrambled to my feet and ran, not looking back. After a long, harrowing run through the forest, I met up with David again. He looked even worse for wear than before. Whereas I had gotten away cleanly, he had been mauled by one of the creatures, just barely escaping with his life. He was bloodied and had gashes on his neck, his forehead, and both of his arms from defensive wounds. Worst of all, he lost his gun in the process, and now we were down to only one weapon for defense. And half the ammo. Eventually we arrived back at the cave, after a long run through the forest, barely escaping with our lives. David was in rough shape, and I helped him lay down on his bedroll. I went outside to find leaves or whatever possible to patch up his wounds, in the absence of bandages. I had a small first aid kit with me as well, which I brought everywhere, but it wasn't nearly enough for the injuries he'd sustained. I cleaned his wounds and packed the worst of them with gauze from my first aid kit, then wrapped them with long leaves from the forest. David began pushing me away when I went to unbutton his shirt, to tend to the wounds on his back. I told him to calm down, but he wouldn't stop resisting me. Eventually I relented and told him to deal with the cuts himself. They wouldn't heal properly if he didn't do something about them. But he just closed his eyes and drifted off to sleep, the blood running from his wounds leaking out onto the rock floor of the cavern while he snored. For the second night in a row, I couldn't sleep. I kept thinking about David and his injuries. He would be dead by morning if I didn't do something. There was too much blood loss. I couldn't understand why someone with his level of experience wasn't taking this seriously. Was he delirious? Suddenly his snoring stopped. The cave was dead quiet and still in the darkness of the night. And then I heard a sound like rocks being moved. A shuffling of feet. Bones creaking and cracking. There was a wet, sloppy sound. Smacking lips and rending flesh. 
someone pulling meat from bone and tearing gristle with sharp incisors. I peered into the darkness of the cave, looking in the direction of the sound, and my eyes slowly began to adjust. David was up. He was eating something in the corner of the dark cave. It looked like. Was it moving? A rat? Or a squirrel? He tore another bite of flesh from the writhing thing which had been moving in his grasp, and suddenly it was still again. The only sound was of him chewing. My eyes adjusted further, my heart pounding rapidly. David's shirt was off. He had treated his wounds after all. In the darkness when I'd been trying to sleep, my eyes closed, he had been busy dealing with his injuries. And I realized why he hadn't wanted me to see beneath his clothes. It all made sense suddenly. The twitching beneath his shirt when he got upset. The way his color changed when he was angry. His face had turned red. Almost purple, like the sky. And beneath his shirt was the most obvious change of all. He took another large bite of whatever it was he'd found scurrying in the cave. And with his four quickly moving hands, he pulled flesh from the bones and crammed more of the creature into his mouth. His eyes were golden and reflective when they caught me staring at him in the darkness. And as I got to my feet I began to run. I stumbled out from the cave, terrified. My legs didn't seem to work properly. Everything around me was wrong, the colors, the shadows, the shapes of the trees and the sounds of the singing birds sitting on their branches. This world was not my own. And I needed to get out. Now, running as fast as I could through the forest, I remembered how I had come to be in this place. As a park ranger trainee, I'd been on a fire lookout assignment and had been sent to confront a few campers who had made a bonfire without a permit, in an off-limits area. But I had stumbled through a gateway to another world in the process, becoming lost in this place. Trapped in another dimension where humanoid creatures with grey skin and four arms hunted people in the purple-tinged darkness. I fell flat on my face, landing hard after tripping over something. A vine? No. Whatever it was, it was thin and sharp and it hurt me badly. The piano wire or whatever it was had cut across my shins, and I felt the warmth of blood trickling from the skin. The traps. I'd forgotten all about the traps David had set, all throughout this part of the forest, to keep him safe from the creatures in this terrifying world. Come back. I heard David yelling over my shoulder from the darkness. It's not safe. You must come back. But I didn't listen. I scrambled back to my feet, and began to run. My only thought was to get to the archway. The place where I'd entered this world. The portal back to earth had to be there. It had to be. David's voice could be heard receding into the distance behind me. I shuddered involuntarily, thinking about how I had seen him in the darkness of the cave eating something like a rat or a mouse. Not only that, but his arms. His arms had been too many. There was an extra pair of hands working at the hairy flesh of the vermin he'd been eating. The bloody fur and the tearing sounds of him ripping chunks from the creature's body with his teeth were too much to think about. At first I thought maybe he was lying to me from the beginning, and that he was from this place all along. Maybe he was born here and was trying to keep me trapped in this place. But the more I considered it, the more I realized that idea didn't sit right with me. David was not a denizen of this terrible violet-tinted world. No, he was from Earth. The way he spoke, talking about Fire Tower 14, which he said he had worked at, proved that he was not from here. He was from Earth. My mind began to work out what this meant and came to the conclusion that being in this world changed you over time. Being here, eating the foraged food and breathing the purple-tinged air. All of it was toxic to people from our world. And it caused side effects that were likely permanent. I only hoped I hadn't been here long enough for a change to occur in me. I shuddered at the thought of an extra pair of arms splitting open the flesh of my abdomen and reaching out, grabbing anything they could get their hands on. Hungry. Desperate for food. For blood and flesh and. I needed to get out of this place. Running through the woods more carefully now, I lifted my feet high off the ground to avoid tripwires, and hoped that I didn't stumble into a spike-filled pit or some other death trap which David had planted. Before being hired as a fire lookout, David had served in the British military, in the SAS, a highly trained branch similar to the Special Forces in America. 
He was a deadly shot with a rifle, and I no longer had mine with me. I picked up my pace, hearing the sound of him coming after me through the forest. He was injured, and that would slow him down, but he also knew this place far better than I did. He knew where the traps were located and how to avoid them. Whereas I was just hoping to be able to find my way back to the archway. The possibility of getting lost forever in the wilderness of this strange world occurred to me briefly, but I tried not to think about it. Trying to remember the way we'd traveled through the forest, I stepped tentatively across the ground, no longer running, but slowly walking through the trees now. I was terrified of stepping on a spike or tumbling into a pit with spikes at the bottom, ready to impale me. David had told me more than once to never go out alone, since he had placed traps everywhere in this area. There was a noise close behind me and I looked back to see David was following me from a distance, gaining on me, and I picked up my pace and began to run again. Come back, he called after me, his voice sounding different now, distorted and wrong. It's not safe. Breaking into a sprint, I hoped to lose him in the darkness. For a time, it seemed to work. He was slower due to his injuries, or his mutations, and was hobbling when I saw him again, trailing me from a distance now. Confident that I'd managed to escape the section of forest where he was hiding his traps, I began to make my way towards the archway. There were certain landmarks David had shown me to find my way back to it, but none of them looked quite the same at night. In fact, nothing looked the same at night. I was starting to worry that I'd become completely lost, when I finally saw the huge oak tree with its one low branch that pointed the way. Following David's prior advice, I continued traveling that direction. After a long period of walking, I realized the sun had begun to rise, looking purple and bloated and wrong as it always did in this world. But at least it gave another indication of which direction I should be walking towards. And it helped to light the way, making the landmarks more obvious as I came across each one. Here was the babbling brook which I would follow for a little while. And there was the strange boulder that looked like a face. I felt a pang of regret at leaving David behind, after he'd saved my life, showing me how to survive in this world. But then I shook my head and reconsidered. No, I couldn't go back to that cave. Maybe he was eating rats now, but what if tomorrow he developed a taste for my flesh? What if I woke up to find him hunched over me, eating my leg or my foot? No. Going back was not an option. If David was still following me, there was no indication of it. I couldn't hear him chasing me anymore and he wasn't calling after me, maybe because he was worried about alerting the creatures to his presence. The clearing where the archway had been was not far now. It was just another 10 minutes or so of walking, and I was just hoping it would be there this time. If it wasn't, I was completely unsure of what I would do. I'd been trying not to think about that part of things, since the idea of the portal not being there was too much to bear. Come back, someone called out from the woods suddenly, startling me. It was David. At least, it sounded like him. It isn't safe. Another voice called out from my right, sounding sped up, then slowed down, like a tape recorder running low on batteries. Leaves crunched on the ground behind me and ahead of me. From all angles there were voices calling out in distorted tones. Come back. It isn't safe. Chrome Bayak. Gressens. The more they said it the more the words didn't sound like words anymore, but just strange, alien noises. They mingled together in an echoing cacophony of sounds. My heart began to pound against my sternum like a jackhammer from the inside. My palms were sweating as I tried to lift my legs to run but realized they wouldn't move. It was at that moment that I observed the fact that I didn't have my rifle, and it dawned on me for the first time that I'd left it back at the cave. With David. And as that thought went through my mind the trees and shrubs all around me began to rustle and sway, moving aside to reveal the grey, four-armed figures who had been lying in wait. If they know you like a particular spot, they'll start to wait for you there. They're adept hunters. And they know exactly the way to ambush someone. Trust me, I've seen it for myself, David had told me. Yeah, I thought bitterly. He'd seen it firsthand with the rat in the cave. As he was turning into one of them, and he was becoming a pretty good hunter himself. The pack of creatures closed in on me from all angles, and I sucked in a terrified breath, 
Unable to scream or run or do anything at all. It was hopeless. Or so I thought. The blast of the rifle was deafening in the stillness of the forest, and I winced at the sound of it, as it took the head off the creature closest to me, which was about to grab hold of me. Run! David screamed from the trees, and this time I could tell very clearly that it was his voice. But at the same time he looked different. He'd left his shirt back at the cave and the extra pair of arms on his abdomen were plainly visible now, and I could see they were holding the rifle. With four hands moving rapidly, David reloaded the gun in a fraction of the time, then had the sights up to his eye again and was ready to fire. I did as he asked, trying to pry my eyes away from the horrifying image of what was happening. The creatures were abandoning me to go after the bigger threat, and I saw them stomping through the brush towards him as he fired the gun again, taking off the top of one of their skulls in a bloody spray. A chunk of grey brain matter landed on my cheek, and I brushed it off in disgust. Getting to my feet, I began to run. But one of the creatures stopped me. The one David had just shot was still alive somehow, and grabbing onto my leg, digging its talon-like claws into the flesh of my ankle, gritting its teeth and staring at me with a brainless, evil hunger. I screamed and howled in pain, turning around and using my other foot to stomp on the thing's face. As it spit out broken teeth it smiled at me, squeezing and digging its nails in deeper, until I could feel blood pouring out and soaking the fabric of my sock. Come back. It croaked in David's voice. Finally I stepped on the thing's arm, wrenching my leg free from its grip. It was like the thing felt no pain at all as it was immediately trying to come after me again with its other good hands. It was like all it desired was to cause pain, but felt none of its own. Trying not to think about that, I turned away and began to run, limping on my one injured leg, ignoring the pain as I broke into a sprint. And just as I got out of sight from David the first heard him cry out in anguish, his screams cut short as one of the creatures began to chew on his windpipe and all that could be heard after that was a hushed gurgling sound far back in the distance, as he drowned on his own blood. Somehow I knew without even seeing it happen. David was dead. But I had no time to mourn for him. I rushed through the trees, trying to ignore the pain in my leg, hoping with every fiber of my being that the archway would be there. I spoke the words in my mind and out loud over and over again, like a mantra, as the clearing came closer and drew into focus. Please be there, please be there, please be there. And when I came out from the trees and into the clearing I almost couldn't believe my eyes. Was this a dream? A mirage? A fantasy that would disappear when I blinked my eyes and opened them again? No. It was there. It was actually there. The archway was back. And just in the nick of time. Without a moment's hesitation I ran through it terrified that it would disappear before I got the chance to step through the threshold and back into my dimension. Like a man terrified of elevators and worried the box will drop out at any second, I leapt through the archway and back into the glorious golden sunlight of our world. I realized immediately what I had been missing, as the blue sky above could be seen through the trees and I noticed I was truly warm for the first time in days. As if I had been walking in shadow, and only now was stepping out into the sun. As I began to walk back towards the road, I took a nervous look back over my shoulder at the archway. And I froze when I saw the disturbing sight behind me was still there. I could still see the purple sky on the other side, and that could mean only one thing. The portal was still open. Terrified of what that implied, I shuddered and continued walking, looking back every so often for creatures, and hoping that the archway would disappear this time for good. But it didn't. As I left it behind in the trees and lost sight of it, my last glimpse showed that evil purple sky shining through from the other side, insidiously waiting for another hiker to stumble through. Or for something else to emerge from the other side. At least if I have to face another one of those creatures, it will be on my turf, I thought to myself with some slight reassurance. But I didn't have a weapon. And I would need backup. I wasn't out of the woods yet. After limping through the forest for 10 or 15 minutes, eventually I found the road. A part of me had been worried it wouldn't be there. That this would be just another world that looked like ours, one of a million different potential places that the archway could take you to, and that I would find myself wandering through some unknown forest again, 
set upon by some new breed of ravenous creatures with a thirst for blood. But, thankfully this did look like the road I had been on before. And I could even see the distinctive tread marks in the mud from what appeared to be a jeep. Maybe from the day when Ross had dropped me off in this very spot. I felt a twinge of anger at the thought of my supervisor, and decided I would let him have it the moment I saw him. He was supposed to be my backup. I was supposed to be learning from him. Instead, he'd let me go out on my own. And now look at what had happened. Limping along the shoulder of the gravel road, eventually I saw the fire tower come into view up ahead. It came into focus gradually, emerging from the trees that hid it from my sight. The jeep was there, and I realized instantly what that meant. Ross was up there. Not out looking for me like he should have been. If he'd been where he was supposed to be none of this would have happened. I climbed the wooden steps leading up to the fire tower, getting more and more enraged as I got further up, and closer to the man who I now believed was responsible for all this. My aching leg was blooded and I could feel it swelling and my pant leg tightening around it. Finally I reached the top and threw open the door, to find Ross sitting at the table reading a book, drinking a cup of coffee. He looked surprised to see me, and shocked at the sight of me. Holy shit, he almost screamed, knocking his coffee cup over. The brown liquid spilled all over the pages of his paperback. You're back. That's right, mother F, I hissed, limping towards him. I could feel my face turning hot and red. His eyes widened further. What's wrong with your face? Are you? Are you okay? You're turning. Purple. I didn't know what to say to that. I looked in the mirror to my left and saw that he was right. I didn't look like myself at all. I looked like a monster made of rage at that moment, my face purple with anger. Suddenly all of the fight left me and I realized how utterly exhausted I was. I heaved out a great sigh and crumpled to the floor of the fire tower cabin. I collapsed on the floor, unable to understand what was happening to me. I didn't feel like myself at all. And as I did that I felt something writhing beneath me. A squirming feeling in my abdomen, like fingers reaching out from inside, trying to poke and tear their way through the skin of my belly. I screamed, pulling up my shirt and clutching my abdomen, feeling the skin for a bulging pair of hands, or a face, picturing the movie Alien. But there was nothing. No indication of anything growing or mutating inside of me. Except a slight tingling there like fingers gently brushing up against my skin from the inside. Tickling me, very lightly. No, I said aloud, still clutching myself tightly. Dude, what the F happened to you? Ross asked, looking at me with grave concern. You've been gone for two days. And now you come back screaming and grabbing at yourself. Your face just went purple as an eggplant, like you had anaphylactic shock for a few seconds, and now it's back to normal again. Tell me, please. Because I am genuinely very concerned. What the hell happened to you out there? I took a few seconds before answering. I honestly didn't know what to say. Until the words began spilling out of me. The same thing that happened to David. That's what happened to me. There was a delayed reaction as it took several seconds for him to register the name. But then he did and his jaw dropped. How? Where did you hear that name? How do you know about David? I met him, I said, and was about to continue, when I heard a sound from beneath the fire tower. It sounded like someone coming up the stairs. I shot up to my feet, my eyes darting around the room. Where's the rifle? You need to get your rifle. Now. Ross didn't know what to make of this at first, and was about to question me, but then the look on my face seemed to convince him. He ran over to the gun rack on the wall and pulled down his rifle. Checking to make sure it was loaded, he took the safety off. Is that David? He asked. I shook my head, no. What the hell did you get us into, exactly? He asked nervously. But before I could respond there was someone at the door. There was a sound of scratching. Long nails against the wood, scraping it. And there was a distorted gray face at the window, looking in at us. Come back, it demanded. Ross held the scope up to his eye and got ready to fire at the door. Then the footsteps began to recede, going back down the stairs. What the F was that thing? Ross asked, lowering his gun. I tried to gather my thoughts,
trying to figure out how to explain it all. Those things are deadly, I said. And they're not from this world. They're smart, and they're almost impossible to kill. Right now they're retreating. Gathering reinforcements. Assembling a hunting party. How can you possibly know all this? I led him outside and pointed down at them below. They were going back for more of their own kind, to bring them into our world. As I looked down from the lofty fire tower I could see them moving quickly into the forest. Some were going back towards the archway, but not all of them. They were planning on staying here. Making this their new home. After all, there was an abundant food supply. And no real reason to leave. I tried to sum up what had happened as well as I could in such a short time. It was difficult for him to believe, but the proof had been right in front of him. The monster had been right outside the fire tower. And we'd seen more of them below us. There was no way to fake that. We needed to do something. Fast. Okay. Assuming you and I haven't lost our minds and just hallucinated whatever the F those things were, I'll take your word for all this. So, what are we going to do? My supervisor asked reluctantly. I considered this for a few long moments. How much gas do we have between the generator and the jeep? I asked. His eyes went wide after he realized why I was asking. For a while he didn't answer. But then he nodded his head and waved for me to follow him. Enough, he said, as I followed him down the stairs. There's enough. You might have heard about the wildfire on the news. It was a big one. There was speculation it was caused by hikers or careless campers, but the real reason why the blaze started was never truly discovered. No one would have guessed it was set by two rogue park rangers, and fire lookouts, no less. The forest fire spread and took out a lot of homes, but everyone who lived in the area made it out alive. Thankfully no one died. I don't know how I would have lived with myself if they had. I was fired from the park ranger service after what happened, as was Ross. With all the news coverage and social media outrage, someone had to be blamed for what happened. And we were the most viable scapegoats. Especially since we'd been seen fleeing the area long before the blaze was ever reported. Our excuse was that the fire started near the road, and we had been down by the jeep when we noticed it. Believing our lives were in danger, we'd fled from the area before being able to radio in to report the wildfire. Unfortunately, there's no way of really knowing if we killed those things. Or if we destroyed the archway. Maybe it can't even be destroyed. Maybe those things can't be killed. It's been years since all of this happened. I'm terrified of the forest these days. I stay out of the woods, and away from nature entirely. I live in a big city, far away from all that business. I work in a high rise and live in an apartment building. And when people ask if I want to go camping I say, hell no. People tell me I'm strange. They talk about me behind my back. One thing that people find peculiar about me is that I never go swimming. I never take my shirt off. And I don't date or try to find a girlfriend, despite people trying to set me up. I don't want anyone to see the changes that have been happening. The arms that have fully sprouted from my abdomen, and have a mind of their own. I try to tie them down, to strap them down with duct tape so they can't move. But they always manage to free themselves. They're very crafty in that way. And they brought with them an unusual appetite. I found myself craving the most disturbing things. Things that crawl and skitter in the subways and in the sewers. Things I have to chase and kill and rip flesh from bones with my bare teeth. It scares me to think about what I'm becoming, and part of me will always be terrified. A voice in my mind screaming that this is wrong, and I need to get help. But another part of me is getting used to it. A primordial, alien part of me, is starting to very much enjoy the hunt. I always wanted to be a park ranger, for as long as I can remember. Being out in nature, hiking, camping, and fishing, that was pretty much all I wanted to do as a kid. Once I realized the profession existed, it was my only career pursuit. And I trained for it like an astronaut going to outer space. Reading up on all of the necessary qualifications, I learned that it was a pretty daunting undertaking in a lot of ways. To be a park ranger, you need to be an expert outdoorsman, you need to be physically strong and of good endurance. 
You need to be confident with firearms if you're working in an area with bears and cougars. And you need to have first aid training and a range of other certifications. But those hurdles didn't stop me. They inspired me. Throughout my late teens and early 20s I had a cork board on my bedroom wall with every park ranger requirement listed on it, flanked by photos of my favorite national parks, and I checked the qualifications off one by one, celebrating as I achieved them. Living at home with my parents I saved up every penny I earned, with the goal of going to school for conservation enforcement, one of several programs geared towards people in my aspiring line of work. Eventually I got my diploma from a nearby community college, which was about all that I could afford. It took a while, and I worked a lot of shitty odd jobs, but eventually I was hired full-time by the forestry service as a fire lookout. This was after at least 30 rejected applications. By that point the recruiters probably knew my resume off by heart, without even reading it. I was thrilled, and accepted the job with a cry of joy over the phone, to which my boss laughed and said he was looking forward to meeting me. Throughout my on-the-job training, I picked things up quickly, and my supervisor, named Ross, said I was a natural. It wasn't long before he was sending me out alone to clear brush or do simple tasks, despite the fact that he was supposed to be shadowing me all the time. He said he trusted me, and that it took a lot to gain his trust. On my last day of training at Fire Tower 14 we were sitting in the cabin playing chess, when Ross noticed something in the distance, a bit of smoke rising up out of the trees. It was just a wisp of white smoke, indicative of a campfire. We should go check that out, Ross said, handing the binoculars to me and pointing. I saw it immediately and nodded, thinking it would be nice to get out and do something different. The routine of clearing brush and taking out the trash, reading books and playing board games and cards, was getting monotonous. It was late afternoon and there were still several hours of sunlight left. I grabbed my backpack and my rifle, filled my canteen with water, and was about to set out, when Ross muttered something over my shoulder. Son of a bitch, he said, a little louder this time. It wasn't like him to curse, and I was a little surprised to hear him do it. Ross reminded me of a boy scout and a man's body, his enthusiasm for the job was infectious, and he was almost always in a good mood. What? I asked, walking over to join him. Another one. Nobody bothers to get a camping permit these days anymore. He pointed at another fire burning in the distance, this one a little closer. Normally we wouldn't go out to bother campers, but these were not registered camping sites, and people like that often didn't bother to clean up after themselves, and sometimes got injured out in the woods, since they weren't prepared. Most people who care enough to go camping properly will actually acquire a camping permit. They know it isn't worth the risk of being fined. These people clearly didn't care. You know what, Ross said, looking at me. This is actually perfect. It's your last day of training, which means next time something like this happens you'll be on your own, nobody around for miles. So let's split up the two offenders and we'll each take one. I'll be in radio contact with you the whole time. They look like they're only a couple miles away from each other. How's that sound? Despite the fact that I'd been eager for the job my entire life, now that I was faced with the prospect of doing it alone I was a little nervous. But I nodded my head, agreeing with his plan. All right, let's do it, I said. Just like we practiced, he told me as we began to climb down the stairs from the tower. Don't get into any confrontations. If they want to get into an argument you walk away and call me for backup, otherwise just give them the citation and move on. Tell them to find a new campsite or we'll be back to confiscate their gear. You know, the usual routine. The two of us took the jeep which was parked at the base of the tower and drove down the dirt trail until we saw the first vehicle, pulled over at the side of the road. It was empty, with no one inside. Okay, you take this one. Radio me once you make contact. Remember, don't take any unnecessary risks. If anything doesn't seem right just let me know. He looked very nervous all of a sudden, and it was making me more worried than I had been a second before. He looked like he wanted to say something else, and opened his mouth as if he were about to do so, but then he shook his head, as if telling himself not to. After a few seconds of awkwardness, 
I reassured him I'd radio him once I made contact. He told me to get going, and stay safe, driving off once I'd shut the passenger door of the jeep. I was left alone, surrounded by wilderness. Taking a deep breath and letting it out, I began to march into the trees, towards the smell of campfire smoke in the distance. The brush was thick, since there was no real trail here. But I could see where the campers had dragged their cooler through the shrubbery, and could make out their boot prints in the mud. If I had to guess, there were at least three or four of them. It didn't take long before I came across a clearing, and standing in the middle of it was a large stone archway. The human-made structure was about a 10-minute walk from the road and looked like a bridge constructed for a railroad to pass over above it. But it made no sense for it to be way out here in the middle of the forest, far from any civilization. And far from any active railroads. A dirt path emerged from nowhere, leading towards this arch, and going underneath it to the other side. I didn't know the area well enough to say that this was completely out of the ordinary, but to my eyes it did look unusual. Ross hadn't mentioned any decommissioned railroads passing through this part of the forest, but then again it could have been long out of use and ancient. When I approached the stone archway, I got a queasy rising feeling in my stomach, like when you're a kid in the back seat of a car and your parents are driving down a hilly dirt road and you go over a steep hill too fast on the opposite side. Looking through the archway, I saw the sky was a bruised shade of purple on the other side. Black clouds floated along, in stark contrast to the clear blue sky which I'd seen from the watchtower. I looked over my shoulder and the sky was blue. I looked straight ahead again and saw it was that surreal purple shade, but only on this side of the archway. What the hell, I muttered to myself, walking through the stone archway to the other side. The moment that I did, my body broke out in pins and needles, as if every limb had fallen asleep for just a second but then the sensation passed. I felt as if I had crossed over through some threshold into another world. But I convinced myself I was just being foolish, letting my adrenaline get to me. This was simply a new and scary experience, being alone by myself out here, but I would need to get used to it fast. Stealing myself with a deep breath, I squared my shoulders and continued marching forward. The forest was still the same, but the sky was that dark purple shade, and I didn't understand why it would look like that. It was still a few hours until sunset, so it wasn't being caused by the sun's approach towards the horizon. It was something else. A forest fire, maybe? Ross, come in, Ross, I said into my radio, which was clipped to my uniform shirt. There was a burst of static but nothing after that. Ross. Status update, come in, Ross? Again, there was nothing. Great some backup you are. The forest swallowed me up again as I walked along the path until it disappeared. Strangely, the woods were difficult to traverse in this section. Huge trees blocked my path, their low branches impossible to get around. I had completely lost the camper's trail, and I was starting to worry I'd lost my bearings altogether, so I pulled out my compass to regain my trajectory. When I looked down at the face of the compass, it didn't make any sense. It wasn't pointing in any one direction. Instead, it spun around in lazy half and quarter circles, reversing and changing direction constantly. Then it began to spin in a maddening arc, faster and faster, going in circles until the glass broke and the needle flew off into the sky, completely unhinged from the device. I heard it was past my ear like a stray bullet. Okay, that was weird. I tried to comprehend what was happening. What could cause a compass to do that? A strong magnet? That was impossible, though. All of this was impossible. I looked up at the sky and traced the bruised purple color, turning my head so I could see behind me. The violet shade now covered the entire sky, including behind me where it had been bright blue just minutes prior. What the hell was going on? I turned around and started back, my heart beating fast, my legs trembling and numb, feeling like blocks of wood attached to the waist. Had a nuclear bomb detonated somewhere? Was this the end of the world? Was that why the sky looks so strange now? I keyed the radio again, hoping I would get a response from Ross as I blundered through the forest feeling sick. It felt like I was going to throw up. Ross. Come in, Ross. I practically screamed into the radio. 
But there was no answer. I began to run, picking up my pace. It was that archway. That archway. I should have never gone through it. I could tell it was wrong. I could tell it was evil. That feeling of pins and needles, that rising sensation in my gut, every part of my body had been trying to tell me not to go through it, but I hadn't listened. I'd heard stories before, read tales on the internet of back rooms and hidden interdimensional portals which led to places like this that shouldn't exist. Dimensions locked away through space and time and other mechanisms we don't understand which people stumble into and can't escape. Stairs that lead to nowhere but take a portion of your lifespan should you decide to climb them, causing you to disappear from your friends and family for untold lengths of time. People vanished in national parks all the time, and there was no explanation for it. At least, not until now. I pushed aside the brush and made my way out of the forest and into the clearing where the archway had been. My heart sank as I stared at the blank spot where it had been. The stone archway was gone. I stood there for a while, just staring at the blank space where it had previously stood. But it didn't change the fact that the thing had vanished. I spun around in circles, thinking maybe I had lost my way and gone off track. Maybe this was all in my head and I had just lost track of time, that was why the sky was purple and why I was having trouble finding my way back. I wasn't trapped in another dimension, I just spaced out and the sun was setting. That was all it was. Nothing more. I convinced myself this was true, even though part of me knew it wasn't. If I kept walking in this direction, I told myself, I would hit the dirt road eventually. I was sure enough of my bearings to know that the road lay in this direction, and I could simply walk back to Tower 14 from there, once I found it. Sure, Ross would be pissed. He would tell his bosses that I needed more training, and that I wasn't ready yet. But that was okay. Maybe I wasn't. Despite all my years of getting ready for this day, maybe I was still just an amateur. With this new plan in mind, I kept walking straight back the way I'd come. I knew better than to push it when it already lost my bearings, not to mention my compass. The best bet was just to walk back to the safety of the road. The longer I walked, though, the more I began to realize what I had suspected deep down was true. The road was not there. Oh no, oh no. Oh no, I muttered to myself as my progress came to a halt. It's not here. The road should have been here. Even if I was slightly off course I should have seen it by now. But it was nowhere to be found. Worse than that, the sky was getting dimmer with those horrible black clouds, covering up the patches of purple and filling them in with malignant darkness. Ross. Please, come in, I yelled into the radio for what felt like the hundredth time. A clap of thunder boomed overhead, sounding discordant and wrong to my ears. It was a bad imitation of thunder, a foley artist still learning the ropes as he shook out a giant sheet of tin like a rug on cleaning day. It warbled and shook the ground, the reverberations lasting far too long afterwards. That was what did it. The sound of that alien thunder brought me over the edge of certainty and I knew for sure in that moment what I had suspected all along. This wasn't the national park. This wasn't even Earth anymore. At least, not my Earth. I truly had slipped into another dimension through that archway. Despite how mad it all sounded, I was on the other side of some multi-dimensional gateway. And not only that, but now the gateway was gone. I was trapped here. Turning around, I decided I needed to go back to the place where I'd found it. Even if it was gone now, it would have to return eventually. That was my only hope. I couldn't stay in this place. I didn't belong here. And who knew what creatures might lurk in a forest like this after dark. Even in our world there were wolves, coyotes, mountain lions, and bears. I shudder to think what version of predator might live unchecked in this universe, without people around to keep their numbers down. As if the forest had read my mind, I heard a rustling sound to my right. The light was dimmer now and it was difficult to see but I thought I noticed something a ways off in the distance, ducking behind trees and hiding from view, following me through the dark woods. Was it a person? It kind of looked like one. Hello? I called out, my voice breaking with fear. Hello? It called back, sounding like a tape recording of my own voice, slightly sped up and slowed down halfway through the word. 
The thing paused momentarily as it ducked out from behind the trees, looking at me, measuring me. Standing in plain view for the first time, as if letting itself be seen. My skin turned ice cold when I caught a full glimpse of it. It saw me, that was for sure. And it was following me. The dark, humanoid shape had grayish-blue skin and at least two sets of arms. It walked on two legs and ducked behind each tree as it passed by, so as not to be seen. Its face was shrouded in long black hair, which covered its visage like heavy curtains. It was completely naked and unclothed, its genitals covered by its long hair, and carrying nothing with it. To my eyes it looked like an animal. A creature more than a person, although it walked on two legs and resembled a human. The extra set of arms was the most jarring aspect of it, though, and made it feel so much more like a nightmare. Like this couldn't possibly be happening. My heart was pounding fast as I tripped over branches and fallen trees, stumbling and rising to my feet and looking to see the thing was even closer now. It was on a diagonal path through the trees, pursuing me but also making its way closer and closer to me. For the first time I saw its eyes behind the mask of tangled hair, they were reflective and gold like a cat in the night. And then I saw its teeth, and its rancid, rotten smile. It rubbed its four hands together in a ball of moving flesh and fingers, like an excited old man about to eat his favorite meal. The creature knew I was scared, and it was enjoying itself. Enjoying the hunt. Another twig snapped underfoot and at first I thought it was my own foot which had done it, since the sound was so close, but then I realized it was only a few feet away. Which meant. I spun around just in time to see a face appear in front of me. At first I thought it was another one of those things, and almost took a wild swing at it. But then I saw the face was human. It was a man wearing a park ranger uniform. His hair was shoulder length and greasy and he had a long beard which was untrimmed and scraggly. Get behind me, he yelled suddenly and I did as he asked instinctively, hearing the sound of movement coming toward us through the brush from where the creature had been. The sound of the rifle's report was deafening. My ears were still ringing when he fired again a few moments later. That's my last bullet, he said, grabbing my arm and pulling me to my feet. I hope you brought some ammunition with you, those things don't like to die. Noises could be heard behind us and I realized that the creature was still in pursuit, despite two well-placed rifle rounds. I was compelled to follow the strange man as he raced ahead of me, looking back at me occasionally to see if I was still trailing him. I didn't have time to ask questions. I didn't have time to think about the fact that the archway was getting further and further away with each step. All I could do was run, and soon the sounds of more racing footsteps joined the first creature. There were several of them, and they were all hungry. Moving in a pack like humanoid wolves. I only hoped this man knew where he was going. And that he had a plan to survive. Let me start off by saying that I was a Boy Scout for 10 years. I started when I was 7, earned my Eagle Scout badge, stayed in until I aged out. So I spent a lot of time in the woods. I love the woods. It's where I feel comfortable. Being out in the wildernesses rejuvenates me. But I'll be the first to admit that at night, the woods are creepy. You can't see anything outside of the campfire light, you can only hear and you can't always tell what it is you're hearing. There were lots of nights I laid in my tent and heard sounds outside with no idea what they were. It was probably just a raccoon or a squirrel, but I was usually too scared to look. In all my years though, I only had one truly frightening experience on a camping trip, and it was in broad daylight. This happened to me when I was 17 years old, 7 years ago. I was on a week-long scout trip at a place called Big South Fork up in the Cumberland region on the Tennessee-Kentucky state line. We spent the first half of the week backpacking up in the hills, and the second half was spent taking it easy at base camp. This happened editing on our last day in the trail. We had finished eating breakfast and we were ready to break camp and head out. Our campsite was at a place called the Lytton Slaven Farm. We camped in a patch of woods in a little valley where they had once had a cattle pasture. At the top of the valley was a small shed, a spring-fed pond, and the old farmhouse. It wasn't a big house. It was a wooden house, 
with two rooms on the first floor and a loft on the second floor. I would have loved to go inside and check it out, but nobody was allowed inside so it would be easier to preserve. Anyway, after breakfast I realized that I had left my walking stick up at the top of the hill by the old house. I went back to get it, and my friend, Chris, went with me. Rule number one, always take a buddy, we hiked up the hill and I got my stick. Then we made the hike back down to camp. We were halfway across the pasture when something told me to look back. I looked behind me and saw someone in the upstairs window waving at me. It looked like a woman dressed in white, but I glanced so quick it was hard to make out the details. I turned to Chris and plainly said, there's someone in the farmhouse. What follows is my thought process that occurred in the space of about half a second. There's someone in the farmhouse. There's nobody else here. Nobody is even allowed in the farmhouse. There's someone in the farmhouse. Shit. There's someone in the farmhouse. I screamed. I took off running as fast as I could. Chris had no idea what was going on and ran with me. We didn't stop until we got back to camp. I told the others what I had seen. You should have gone in, said our scoutmaster, Chris's dad, she probably had breakfast ready. Real funny. We got back to base camp and told everybody else what had happened. Of course, they didn't believe me. That was completely understandable. I'm a bit of a skeptic, and I was halfway convinced that it was a park ranger, or just a glare on the glass. But I'm also naturally curious, and it just kept nagging at me. Who was it? What was it? Why was it? A person? A ghost? I had to know. That night, curiosity got the better of me. Chris and I were in our tent, about to bed down for the night. Chris, did you see that person in the farmhouse this morning? I asked. No, he answered. But I saw you running, so I started running. I know I saw something. I swear, it looked like a woman waving at me. Okay. And that doesn't seem the least bit interesting to you? I guess a little bit. Let's go back and check out that house. We can't just leave camp. Well then let's go right now. While everyone is asleep. We'll be back before anyone knows we're gone. You're crazy, he said. Come one, I responded. A scout is brave, right? He sighed. Fine. Let's go. In hindsight, what we did next was really stupid. Even with a buddy, you should never wander off into the woods at night, especially if you don't tell someone at base camp. But we were young and dumb and adventurous. So we grabbed our flashlights, put on our boots and hit the trail. The farmhouse was only three miles from base camp so it didn't take us long to get there. We went inside and didn't see anything of interest. The first story had dirt floors and there was nothing inside but a heavy layer of dust on the timber floors of the second story. There was absolutely zero evidence that there had been anybody in that house for a very long time. Look, I said. No footprints. Yeah. No footprints, he replied. Nobody was here. Or it was a ghost. Cut that out, man. Why? Does it scare you? I asked. Yeah. Kinda. Well there's nothing here, I said. Might as well go back to camp. We left the house and set off back to camp. Do you remember how I said it's stupid to wander into the woods at night? What happened next demonstrates this perfectly. We were walking down the trail and walking down the trail, and walking down the trail. Shouldn't we be there by now? I asked. Yeah, replied Chris. It feels like it's taking us longer to get back than it took us to get here. I checked my watch. It took less than an hour to get to the farmhouse. Since we had left the farmhouse, said we had been walking three hours. Dude, I think we're lost, I said. Looks like it. I sat down on the ground to rest and to think about what we needed to do next. I felt something hard and cold under me. What the heck? What is it? Asked Chris. I sat on something, I answered as I wiped off the surface. Under the leaves, there was a tombstone. It was small and square and looked old. Well. That's creepy, said Chris. I read the inscription aloud. Archie Slavin. April 30th, 1935 through February 19th, 1936. Geez. He was just a baby. Now I'm depressed. Just then, 
A cold breeze blew down the trail. Dang that's cold, I said. This is getting really weird. The breeze got stronger. I heard something. It was clear and distinct and sounded like a woman. Call me crazy but I know I heard a voice say, my baby. The weird thing about it was that I couldn't tell if someone actually said it, or if it was just in my head. Did you hear that? I asked. Hear what? He asked. Someone said my baby. Um. I thought I just imagined it. Man. Let's get out of here. We followed the trail back the way we came and made it back to camp just before dawn. We didn't tell anyone about our late night journey. The day went by uneventfully. We played games, built fires, tied knots. You know, scout stuff. That night, a park ranger was making his rounds through the campgrounds. Before he left, Chris and I decided we needed to ask him a few questions. What can I do for you boys? Asked the ranger. Well, I started. We were wondering if you could tell us about the Lytton Slavin farmhouse. It's an old farmhouse. Almost a hundred years old, he answered. Matter of fact, it belonged to the family that used to own a lot of the land in the park. Is there anything else? Asked Chris. Like what? Is there anything unusual about it? The park ranger smiled. You boys met Miss Marjorie. Who is she? The ranger cleared his throat and told us the tale. The Littons started the farm way back in the 1800s. The farm was passed down from generation to generation and eventually went to James Slavin. James passed it down to his son, Jim. Jim married Marjorie and they had a little baby boy. Archie, I exclaimed. Yeah, said the ranger. Archie. Well when Archie was just a baby, he was carried off into the mountains by a wolf. That's terrible, said Chris. It gets worse, said the ranger. The body was never found. They searched for weeks. Jim combed over every inch of those hills and couldn't find anything. Miss Marjorie went mad with grief. Even when the search was abandoned, she insisted that her son was still alive. And then one day, while Jim was out in the pasture tending to the cows, Marjorie hung herself from the rafters. She left a note that said I'm going to find my baby. After that, Jim couldn't take it anymore and he sold the farm to the state. He buried his wife at the church cemetery and put a monument for his son on a hillside overlooking the valley. Chris and I were silent. The ranger continued. Miss Marjorie shows herself every now and then. Just the way you described it. She stands in the upstairs window and waves. But you can't go in the house. Chris and I looked at each other. Why not? I asked. The ranger smirked and said, you boys went in the house, didn't you? I nodded. The ranger chuckled as he told us, well boys, you took her up in the invitation. Now you're part of the search party. And she'll never let you forget it. We didn't understand what he meant and he left before we could ask him. But that night, we figured it out. All night long, Chris and I both heard the whisper, my baby. Seven years have passed. I don't hear the whisper as often. It went from constant, to once or twice a day, then less and less often. Some days I think Miss Marjorie forgot about me, but every few months she reminds me what I'm supposed to be looking for. My baby. Thanks for watching. Be sure to subscribe for daily stories. We at Horror Den of Misfits really enjoy this, and your support would be appreciated.